Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 11 through 18. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham." Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us to your house tonight to worship and praise you, Lord. Thank you for being a God that answers our prayers, Lord. Thank you for interceding with us. Thank you for being there in our times of trouble, Lord. Lord, be with our sister churches and all those who are gathering today to worship you. Be with me as I preach this message, Lord. Fill me with the Spirit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this sermon is called The Greatest Sympathy for man, but when I started working my job at Sugar Creek, I started out as an apprentice. This is the stage of learning and growing in a job field. So when I started my pr apprenticeship, we go back and forth between two separate plants, getting trained by two different people. So I started out at our newer plant first. I started learning the trades learned the company, learned the tricks. And I was really green going into my apprenticeship, so I had a lot to learn. Well, right when I get used to the newer plant, they go and send me to the older plant. And with the older plant, it meant a new person training me. And this is confusing because all ammonia systems are different. They're the same, but they're always somehow different. I was, ta I was tasked with figuring out this new plant as well as working with this new person. And you guys should know how working with this new person was difficult because this person was Daniel Pearson. I thought since I knew Daniel, this was going to be great. I thought I had it made in the shade. I thought he was going to take it easy on me since he knew me a little bit. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> So Daniel, he sends me into our engine room, the location with all of our equipment, and he has me looking for equipment. And he sends me to find this hidden piece of equipment. So as I look for this equipment, he told me, you do not stop until you find this piece of equipment. So I went into our engine room and I looked and looked and looked, kept looking. I couldn't find it. So I go and ask Daniel for help, and with the biggest smirk, he tells me to get right back in there and keep looking. So I keep looking and keep looking, and I finally give up, and I go to Daniel, and I'm like, I cannot find it. So then he brings me in, and he shows me where this piece of equipment, which is hidden, is, and he has the biggest grin on his face, but then it all starts to make sense. And it taught me a lot because they do it to provide you with looking at the equipment and it provided some fun for the more experienced people. Well, soon enough, soon enough, I get certified and the next apprentice comes. And I'm over working with Daniel and I see Daniel send this guy in to do the same exact thing, to search for this piece of equipment. Well, about an hour later, he comes up to me and he asks me, where, where is it? Can, 
just tell me where it is. And I laugh, I was like, get back in there. But then after a little bit, I felt bad. So I went in there and I showed them where this tricky piece of equipment was. Now the reason we do this is for them to learn, but I felt bad. That's the moral of the story. I felt bad. I became sympathetic and I decided to show them a little mercy on the situation. I saved them about another hour or so searching. So needless to say, I showed them sympathy. And sympathy is one of the greatest acts of love. And Christ was sympathetic towards us. He cared about us. He, he gave us mercy. A mercy that extends far more than anything we can provide. A mercy that we saw great lengths taken. I mean, He took the form of man to show us mercy. He made us one with Him. And we are going to look deeper into this great mercy and this sympathy that Christ had for us. So starting out, we're going to see how we are related to Christ. In verse 11, it said, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So this verse starts that we are together as one through sanctification. Isn't that awesome that the sanctified are one with the sanctifier? And that sanctifier is Christ. They are the ones chosen by God. They are the saved. They are, when you're saved, you're saved by the glory of God. You become one with the sanctifier. The one who cleanses you and purifies you from wretchedness. The one who makes us white as snow. He's the one that brings us from eternal damnation. And that sanctifier is none other than Jesus Christ. And being in this unit with Christ and being saved by the blood of Christ, it makes us family with Him. It makes us brethren with Him. Then this verse goes on to say, for which cause He is not ashamed to call them brethren. This makes me think of my childhood. I had this really great friend, a friend I had for years, but when we got older, we started coming across the cooler kids. And when we came across the cooler kids, I would try to distance myself from him. I would try to space myself. Why? I was embarrassed to be around him because they didn't think he was cool enough. And it's a bad thing to do, especially looking at this verse. Because looking in here in this verse, Jesus is not ashamed of us. He's not embarrassed of us. And he is fully accepting of us as family, as brethren. Think about it. We're guilty sinners. We're wicked. We're vile. We're tainted. We're not even worthy. But yet Christ isn't even embarrassed to call us His brethren, to call us His own. Why? Because Christ's sanctification process is perfect. What He did on the cross is perfect. He is perfect. And His blood shed for us washed away that vileness and wickedness from us. It cleansed us. And it brought us anew. It made us suitable to be called Christ's brethren. It's His perfect blood. Christ Jesus isn't embarrassed to call His brethren. Because His brethren has His perfect blood. And our Lord's blood is what cleanses us, right? There's nothing to be embarrassed about having the blood of Jesus with you. In fact, we should be proud to have that blood. That blood is a blessing and a gift for us. We have a lot to be ashamed about in our lives. Our iniquities, when we fall, when we fail. But through Jesus, our standing is perfect because of that blood. That's the magnificence of Christ's work here. Even though we are unworthy with the blood of Jesus, He makes us worthy. He will be able to take us to the Heavenly Father without any shame or any reproach and say to the Heavenly Father, He is my brethren. What a special thing we have as Christians. To have Christ as our family. It says, For both He that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause He is not ashamed to call them brethren. When I think of Christ calling us brethren, Think back to the book of Genesis with Joseph. 
Joseph's brethren hated him. They constantly opposed him. They mocked. They ridiculed Joseph. They sold him into slavery. For what? A couple, a couple of pieces of silver? Sad, right? They turned away from Joseph. Yet, when it came down to it, when his brethren repented from it and turned from it, Joseph did not hold his grudge. Grudge. He did not latch on to their mistreatment like many humans do. And after their repentance, he, repentance, he had no problem calling them brethren. And he would go on to do a lot for them. Egypt looked down upon shepherds, but Joseph took them straight to Pharaoh and vouched for them. And they accepted them in. So we look at this story and we see how the brothers of Joseph were. And a lot of us are probably thinking, would we'll never be there. How could he forgive them? We see how wicked they were. But it's a representation of how we are before Christ saves us. Before we're saved, we're just like Joseph's brethren. But Christ, he did a far greater act than Joseph. I mean, he came and died on a cross for us. So that when we believe upon the name of the Lord and come to repentance, we are forgiven for those crimes that were previously unforgivable. Christ calls us brother, even though we wronged him. It's astonishing to us. But the Lord is not unashamed of us. He's not ashamed of us. and does not stop at the sanctification, but they state it through Scripture here as well. If you go to verse 12, it says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise Unto thee. So this verse is a reference to Psalms 22, 22. The psalm is the psalm about the cross. The psalm on what was to come and that the gospels prove did come. And this verse tells us that through Christ's pain and suffering at his cross, through this pain, he comforted himself with the thought of all the people who will be saved, who will be engraved in eternity and identified with Him forever through His death. Praise God for His deliverance. Jesus takes comfort in this. This shows His love for us. It's like when we are in a time of trouble. Usually what comforts us is the thought of our family or the thought of God. I've been there before. And that's what comforted Christ when he was on that cross. Comforted knowing the depth of his death, the, the great purpose of it, knowing what it will do. And going a step further with, the, with this verse, there's a fact of Christ being involved in the church. That's very special to think about, right? He's involved in Witten Place Baptist Church. He's involved with us now. Because we are family and we're united as brethren with the same goal. And the more and more I think of this, I am thankful and proud to be part of Christ's brethren. To be related to the one and only Jesus Christ. And not only this, we go a step further in verse 13. It says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. So this verse here refers back to Isaiah 8, verses 17 through 18. But this is really reaffirming the trust God had in the heavenly Father to fulfill the prophecy, to be faithful. And he includes the saved in this, the ones who are chosen by God. And that's why we are where we are. We're saved through trust and faith in Christ and that the God the Father is faithful to His promise. Listen, hey, we see a lot of feebleness. We see a lot of weakness in the world and Christians. But Christ, He sees past this weakness. He sees past this feebleness. And what He sees is the fulfillment of God's plan. That's why he calls us brethren and is happy to claim us as such before God the Father. So we looked at our relation to Christ. 
But next, we're going to see how we were rescued by Christ. Verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. The first part of this verse lays out Christ's rescue of us taking the form of man. This was very necessary. Just as we are flesh and blood, Christ became flesh and blood. He came as we came. Oh, the sacrifice. This was right here alone. For God to come down from heaven, the greatest place imaginable, and to take the form of man. To be in a world full of sin and corruption, which God hates. To come into a world infested with the things he hates. To save the people partaking in the things he hates. The love of Christ is shown greatly in just that. Just coming down here as man. We're always, as Christians, focused on the deity of Christ, which is beautiful. But sometimes we let ourselves forget the humanity of Christ and the beauty and that the lengths shown through it, the amount of sacrifice it was for God. He did it for us. This is what Christ accepted for us. The incarnation of Christ was so important. Note back to the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She is pagan. And Mosaic law cut her off from Israel until the 10th generation. But then came Boaz, a man near of kin, and he accepted Ruth with grace and with kindness. And this man was the only man who could be the redeemer for Ruth. Why? Because he had a near of kin relationship. And so it is with Christ for us. In order for us to be redeemed and rescued, we needed a near of kin relationship. Thus Christ took the form of man. He became the kinsman redeemer for us. He took the flesh for us. He became the near of kin relationship for God's chosen people. What a blessing it was for Jesus to accept flesh and blood for us. And then the second part of this verse points out what Jesus came to do. It says that through death, He might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So Jesus accepted humanity to do what we can never accomplish. He came to destroy the one who seeks our destruction. The one who tries to make us fall. The one who tries and tempts us away from God. We talked about a few weeks ago in 1 John, the world being the enemy. But Jesus here is confronting one of the other two enemies. He's confronting Satan himself. And guess what? In Jesus' human death, he provided the victory. He provided a power over Satan. He provided a power over death. He ripped the sword from Satan's hands and won. That's why the death of Jesus is called a victory. It's the greatest victory, the mightiest victory. It's the victory that ultimately wins the war. Listen, because of this victory, Christ, Christians do not need to fear Satan anymore. Because of this victory, Christians do not need to fear death anymore. Because of Christ's victory on Calvary, death is no longer a punishment, but it is a gift from God. Think about it. Death is a true joy for a Christian. We always get intimidated by the word death. The fear it brings. The uncomfort it brings. And yes, it is a sad moment for us still on earth. But it's not sad because they left this world. It's sad for us that we don't get to see them for a long time. But for the dying person, death is the start of a new beginning. Death 
is no more pain and no more suffering. Death is getting to heaven and being closer with Christ. A true gift that we all long for as Christians. Death for a Christian is a celebration of life. And it's not a celebration of their hum, human, human life that ended, but it's a celebration of their heavenly life that's beginning. Death takes from this life, moves us closer to God. Death is one of the greatest gifts we receive from God. Jesus gave us the power over it and the power over the one who controlled it. But Jesus accomplished more as well. If you look in 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Let's face it, death still scares us. Death is frightening. Death is our final foe. Spurgeon said, since death is the last enemy, we should save him for last. There's no bypassing death. It's a fact of life. It's our final battle. But because of Christ's accomplishment and rescue of us, the battle became a whole lot easier. It's no longer difficult knowing the feat Christ did for us. In fact, death is an exodus from this world. It's a big thing to beat. I'm going to give us a reference here and just make it comparable to the book of, to the book of Exodus. Moses, Moses parted the Red Sea to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. Christ parts the waters of death, something that was once non-surmountable, and delivers us from this life to the next. We won't have to swim through the rough waters of death to get to heaven. Many will try, but if you try to swim through the waters, you will drown. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the waters that Christ parted. And through those, we will get there on dry ground. It says, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death and Satan's power is what held us back before we were saved. It had us in what we call bondage. We were restrained because of these things and subject to it because of bondage. But Christ is what freed us from it. He rescued us from this captivity. He cut the chains off. He removed the shackles. And He did it for us. That's what's wonderful about having a deliverer. Having a God who rescues us not leaves us from what seemed unreachable. So after looking at our relation with Christ and how we were rescued with Christ, we're going to get to the third point, and it's how we are reconciled through Christ. And this point really points to the sympathy Christ displayed for us how our high and mighty God understands us as humans. Let's look at verse 16. It says, For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. This was huge. Christ came down as Abraham's seed. And it's pretty important because this is coming out of the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews were Abraham's descendants. Thus is exemplifying that Christ came down like the people this letter was directed for. And there's no doubt in my mind that God wants us to know that the audience, that Christ came down to earth like you, like me, in a human nature. He did not take on angelic nature, a nature that is commonly thought of as better, but He took the nature of man. He came here like us. He suffered like us. He had emotions like us. Yet, He did not sin like us. He stayed perfect. Christ came down like this for a reason. To understand us. For example, 
I work in refrigeration. And refrigeration is part of maintenance, but is also separated. Needless to say, when stuff hits the fan, the other maintenance guys like to try to come in and help us, to try to help us to the best of their abilities. But even though they're maintenance, they can only help to a certain extent because they don't fully understand refrigeration. And then their help becomes more burdensome than helpful. Why? Because they never were in refrigeration. And they don't get what it's like to be in refrigeration. And they don't know what refrigeration is. But you know who does get what it's like that? A person that's done it before. A person that has experienced it before. Those are the helpful ones. Christ is perfect to save humanity because He became a human and taken the form of human and being a human. He understands us more than anyone we know or anything we know. I mean, think about it. This understanding of us is what makes Him such a powerful intercessor for us. He gets things when we have hard times expressing it. He gets things that we might not even fully understand. He tells, he tells our problems that we might not even know of. That's why taking the form of human was so important for Christ. To understand us. To understand what we need as humans. And not, just under the, not just that, but understanding in a very precise matter. Verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and powerful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for their sins of the people. So Christ became this faithful high priest, our faithful high priest. And He took the form of humanity to do this work in service to God the Father the best possible. And I want to note here in this verse that it says He will be our high priest in things pertaining to God. It's in service to God. Many false believers, they pray to an upper power, but they pray for things just to benefit them in this world. They pray to benefit the world, to benefit their sin. But Jesus is faithful to the things pertaining to God not the world. And He intercedes for us. And He does so faithfully. Think about it. When your heart has a need, the Son of God is interceding to you, for you to God the Father. That's amazing to think about. It's even sometimes hard to grasp. He brings us to a place that we cannot reach without Him. Our Savior takes care of our needs in the present of God. It's truly a special thing. But furthermore, He intercedes and is merciful. The key word, merciful there. The topic of this sermon is about God's sympathy to man. And what greater form of sympathy than mercy? He showed us mercy when He died for our sins. But it doesn't stop at the end of His humanity. It continues on. After death, He intercedes for us. And He makes it known to God the Father that our sins are cleansed by His blood. This verse says He reconciles our sins. The sins of His people. Christ does this. God the Father. And tells Him that we are His brethren. That we are His family. We should be fully recognizing the greatness of Christ here today. And finally, we see Christ's understanding us through experience. Verse 18, For in that He Himself hath suffered being tempted, He is able to succor them that are tempted. We touched on this a bit already, that Christ's experience on earth Suffering, the temptations he experienced, these humanly experiences, made him a great savior to us and a, and a savior that understands our ways and our needs. Another example, we see many politicians run for office today. And they say they're for the American people. 
and they love to say they're for the middle class. Now, not many of them come from the middle class, but it's safe to say that the middle class rather see someone from the middle class represent them than someone not from the middle class. Why? Because they know what it's like to be in the middle class. They know middle class problems. Why the other one doesn't. They don't have it. They, the middle class person understands it more. And that's why Christ came down as human. He understands us more. He understands us more than anyone. He understands hunger. He understands thirst. He understands sadness. He understands pain. Understands temptations, which this verse points out. And he's been going through it, except for any sin we've committed, to be the perfect representative. The representative to God the Father. It says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to secure them that are tempted. The second part of this verse shows us that we have a sympathetic Savior we need. The word secure here means to assist and support, especially in times of hardship. So Jesus faced temptation on this earth so that he can help us when we go through it. His earthly ministry was all about helping us and to serve God the Father. To be there for us in our times of need, in our times of suffering. And it's so significant to the Christian. When we're all in a hard time, we go to that thought that God is with us and he understands us. And it's a blessing. So concluding, I want us to reflect on the humanity of our Savior, the sacrifices and suffering He did for our sake, a painful death for our sake. And through that death, He sanctified God's people. And even in our iniquities, He called us brethren. Something He is still proud to call each and every one of us. Why? Because we are clean by His blood. He is what keeps us from being an embarrassment. It's amazing that Christ came to earth, defeated death, defeated the devil, freed us from bondage, and experienced this life so that He can help us through ours, through our hardships, through our troubles, and not only that, to intercess to the Father for us, to reconcile our sins for us, to cleanse us, the beauty of our Savior is exemplified here tonight. Be grateful we have a Savior that will help you when you call upon His name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for coming down as a man. Something that I'm just very grateful for, Lord, because it provided us with so many blessings, and I'm sure so many blessings that we still don't understand. And Lord, we just thank You. And we thank you for interceding for us. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done in dying on that cross for our sake. And we had no hope. I ask this in Jesus' name.